are now fit for the next talk. Um, we have here Kai Hamacher and Stefan Katzenheiser, who are going to talk about Bitcoin, one of the most exciting topics of the last year. And so please uh, welcome them with a huge round of applause and let's go. Yeah, hi everybody, good morning. Um, this is a talk, well, already mentioned over, about Bitcoin and thanks a lot for having us here and all, well, the huge audience in this beautiful room. Um, today, well, we will present um, an overview of several results that finally converge more or less to uh, some of the problems and some of the interesting aspects of Bitcoin. Um, but before going into that, let us briefly introduce ourselves um, and you know, to motivate why, why we're actually doing this Bitcoin stuff. And let me introduce Stefan, who is working at Darmstadt University on IT security and especially on a concept called privacy by design so that the technology already provides for privacy. Um, he had already a talk on day one of uh, the Congress, probably have already uh, looked at it on the video stream or whatever, um, got already nice press coverage. Um, so can trains be hacked? Interesting stuff. And we uh, were teamed together uh, because there are a lot of effects in networks and uh, well, there's obviously a security issue and last year we were presenting some results of networks of telecommunications uh, uh, graphs and that led actually to, well, a talk last year here and a paper about why tele telecommunications data retention is not that good an idea. Yeah, and let me, let me introduce Kai. So Kai is the only colleague of mine who's actually uh, active in three departments at our university. So in the physics department, biology department, and computer science department. Um, his, uh, one of his core research interests is simulation and also information theory. And that's the reason why we found together at some point in time. And uh, we also use those tools today to um, look at Bitcoin. So first, let's ask the question, I mean, why, why Bitcoin? Why is this interesting at all? And I think there, are, at least from my point of view, there are two reasons for that. The first reason is that uh, it's probably the first digital currency that seems to fly. Right? I mean, cryptographers had this idea of paying by digital means in the early 80s. Think of uh, papers by, uh, by Schaum that were published, like, uh, I think, 84, 83 already. And so far, we haven't seen any digital currency or digital payment system that really uh, made it to, the, to, the, to, the, well, to, to big audience groups. And in my opinion, Bitcoin seems to be the first one that actually achieved this or is about to achieve it. And the second point that we'll see later on uh, Bitcoin is a very interesting playground for network analysis yeah? because you can look at all the Bitcoin transactions that have been performed since, th since the start of this network and it gives you a lot of information. You, you can do all nice kind of analysis there. Uh, so it gives you a really, really big set of, of empirical data on how people interact. Yeah? And so far I haven't seen this big amount of data uh, out there for any other payment system. Good, let me start a little bit with a question on what is Bitcoin at all. So if you look it up into, in, in the, well, perceived probably the only source of information these days, if you look it up in Wikipedia, uh, it says Bitcoin is a decentralized electronic cash system using P2P networking, digital signatures and uh, cryptographic proofs. Um, <clears throat> and it enables payments between parties without relying on trust and notes broadcast transactions in network, which records them in a public history after validating them using a proof of work system. So the, so the whole concept was, was, was designed by Satoshi Nakamoto in uh, uh, 2009. Uh, this, he, this is probably a pseudonym, so we, we still don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, I think this slide summarize, summarizes it, it pretty well what Bitcoin actually is. But let's go a little bit more into detail on to, in the technical details of Bitcoin. So how does Bitcoin work with a client interface, which is called a wallet? And this uh, wallet can be used by clients to actually make transactions. And this wallet contains uh, public and private key pairs of uh, a special signature scheme, so of elliptic curved, uh, curved DSA. And uh, the public addresses, so this, this, uh, those public keys, 
form of Bitcoin uh, names an address. Yeah, an address is essentially a, a pseudonym of a person or a pseudonym of an entity that can authorize payments and that can receive payments. And if someone wants to make a payment, all he does is he takes one of his addresses, so every party or every user can have multiple addresses, but we'll, we'll see later, uh, and actually make a transaction and sign a statement like, okay, I'm owner of this address, I want to transfer X bitcoins to a certain other address. And this signed statement is somewhat broadcast to a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, and this peer-to-peer -peer network has the task of actually validating all the transactions. So if you look at this basic principle, you see immediately that there are two problems that Bitcoin needs to solve, right? One is uh, the problem, how can we prevent double spending? So how can we be sure that one person that owns an address can only spend the amount of Bitcoins that he has, and that he can't double spend the same Bitcoin twice or three times or whatever? Um, and this is done by actually verifying all transactions in a distributed manner. So all the clients, somehow run some kind of distributed consensus protocol, and uh, once enough clients actually agree that this transaction is valid, then it gets permanent. And the second problem that we have is, what about anonymity? Yeah, so you broadcast to the world actually who is paying how much bitcoins to which person. Uh, so what about pseudonyms? Or what about, what about anonymity, right? I mean, there was a hu huge fuzz about SWIFT uh, data, uh, 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 exchange, and now here we have something similar, right? I mean, everyone can see who is paying what. And Bitcoin tried to solve this by introducing pseudonyms. So pseudonyms are essentially public keys of a signature um, system, and those public keys, contrary to classical signatures, are not certified. So everyone, every user can generate a number of those public, public keys, and any public key he uses can be used as an identifier. And as long as you don't know the linkage between this public key and the real person, then you can assume that you have some form of anonymity. Yeah? So, so the crypto community calls this a, pseud a pseudonym. So you make this action under, un under a certain name, but no one's actually able to link this name with, um, with your real identity. So what about all those transactions? So I mentioned before that all those transactions are broadcasted into a P2P network. And what actually happens is that uh, multiple clients will actually verify a transaction. And they do this by taking all the unverified transactions so far, or at least most of them, and hash them together with some kind of nonce. So a nonce is just a random string yeah, that somehow randomizes the hash. And what, what the client actually then publishes is the list of transactions together with this hash. Yeah? And the nice thing, or the nice feature of um, of bitcoins is, is that uh, the person who actually does this work, I mean, this, this requires some kind of significant CPU usage, <laughs> gets some kind of reward, right? So everyone who does this verification gets some, gets some bitcoins out of this mere fact that they actually verified the transaction. And uh, Bitcoin wants to limit the amount of new bitcoins that, 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 that are generated this way. And therefore, what uh, the client has to do is he has not only to hash this, uh, this list, but he has to find a nonce in such a way that the resulting hash yeah, has some kind of pre, uh, uh, preceding zeros. So the hash sh should start with a certain number of zero bits. Yeah? So it actually needs to find a nonce through brute force, such a way that this hash of the nonce together with the list gives you a hash that starts with lots of zeros. And by selecting the number of zeros you, you require, you can actually uh, make this process of, of verification harder. Right? because uh, it just requires more trials until you find such a nonce that, that, that has this property, right? Always, of course, assuming that the hash function, which is uh, SHA-256, is, uh, is uh, cryptographically stable. Yeah, and once enough clients verify the, the transaction, it finally gets definite. Good, I've already talked about this, so there's this, this uh, reward model that's called mining. Everyone who, who, who verifies a transaction is able to actually mine a Bitcoin, and this difficulty of work is actually adjusted by selecting this uh, number of, 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 of zeros that the hash needs to have. And this essentially limits the amount of Bitcoins available, and at the moment we are at the, at, uh, at the situation where no single computer is actually able or realistically able to verify those transactions anymore, so this, uh, the amount of work that you need to spend is so large that at the moment uh, a single PC is actually not, not capable of doing it anymore. Yeah, and <clears throat> this brings us immediately to 
what is it good for, right? And a lot of people uh, discuss what Bitcoin could be good for, and probably is a lot of wishful thinking uh, involved here. But I think two, two major things need to be mentioned. So there was uh, uh, Rick, which, uh, who is, uh, if you don't know, the founder of the Swedish Pirate Party, and he has well, put this blog post, why I'm putting all my savings into Bitcoin. And you already see savings, bitcoins, well, it's an economical argument, but it's about savings, right? On the other hand, just recently, uh, there was an Ars Technica uh, uh, um, uh, blog post um, saying that it, bitcoin not really is a currency, which is definitely true from a legal point of view, but rather a meta currency that is a medium of exchange, so replacing Western Union, for example, Probably also for the bad guys doing all these Nigeria scams. But anyway, um, and there's a slight, a slight change in the, in the reasoning why Bitcoin might be a good idea. Um, and the first one is um, why, why here we, we learn that, that on the one hand it's good as storage of value. Um, the reason why it is as you know, uh, substantial or a sustainable storage is actually a kind of cynical argument if you read the blog post because he claims that the value maintenance so to speak um, is due to the fact that we do a lot of transactions and that you if you just take the economy the black market economy of drug trafficking um, then this is already so big that Bitcoin or there are not enough bitcoins basically to at least cover a fraction of drug trafficking. So the value comes actually from the transaction and the, the utility that you get from the transactions here. The same is here, but he is really focused on that it's only about transactions, right? It's not really that you store and save money, even make money by interest or whatever, but rather store stuff uh, and transmit that to some other place where you then convert it to a local currency. Um, all that is the start for our economic analysis. So, I mean, Bitcoin is um, an adaptive complex system, a network with interesting dynamics, but in the end, um, the people who invented it and put it forward and are working on it want to have it as an economic tool. So, is it really fulfilling the economic promises? Um, well, first, let me do some philosophical remarks. When you read all the, the Bitcoin uh, blog posts and in and, 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 the forums and so on, you get basically two major ideas. So there's no central control, right? There's no government, no politicians, which might be a good thing. Well, I don't know. Um, but it's really about that nobody could control what you're doing. And there's another misconception. There's no surveillance, which is definitely not true. We come to that later. And at the same time, uh, a, r a rather economic argument that you get rid of the banking business model. Um, so you don't have all these bank bankers around, right? who basically live on our savings, on our work, on our efforts. And that is the good thing about Bitcoin. But what nobody really thought about probably, I mean, in this community, probably the Tobin tax is very popular. But if you think about that, if Bitcoin really, you know, scales up and becomes really popular, there is no way in the current protocol that you can implement all the leftist ideas on control of the banking system. Um, so there will probably be new bankers, but you know, they can avoid the Tobin tax if you do it by, bit, by using Bitcoin, right? Um, the same, or well, kind of a different argument, but it puts also forward the idea that we need to change the protocol um, because really the system doesn't scale. You have this huge history file and there's some ballpark figure what kind of uh, net or what bandwidth you would need to really, you know, be in the network up to date all the time and that means um, you cannot really scale unless you become a special provider of services for Bitcoin which is basically a bank right so probably it's not called a bank but it's the same concept okay that was just some economic remarks on well national economy or global economy but now really into the microeconomical stuff um, there is a concept in economics called elasticities and the elasticity of a good or whatever a service is basically the change in the quantity you get or is provided uh, up on price changes. So you have a delta in the amount that is produced, that is available, that someone gives or would give uh, voluntarily to you while there is a change in the price. 
The problem is this really depends on the units you choose, right? And as we are talking about a replacement of currencies, blah, 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 it's probably not good to have this, this ratio here expressed in US dollars, euros, whatever. So wh what people came up with is really a relative fraction. So what you do is the relative change in the quantity on the market available divided over the absolute quantity at that particular point, and that then divided by the relative change in the price. And you can do some algebra on that, um, that is basically boils down as an approximation then of this funny formula. So the elasticity is the partial derivative, just uh, to be annoying here and ins ins uh, insisting on mathematics. The partial derivative of the logarithm of the price with respect to the, uh, to the logarithm of uh, the quantity with respect to the logarithm of the price. So if you do that now, and there's a grain of salt here, um, I used the data of Mount Cox, which is a service that transfers bitcoins to dollars or dollars to bitcoins and I used the public available data on transactions there assuming that this is really the demand and the supply on the market uh, bitcoin versus US dollars and um, so the, the the service or the quantity here the good is the bitcoin and the price is expressed in dollars <clears throat> um, so there is no equilibrium in economics never ever so it's it's a, an approximation, but anyway, you end up with an elasticity of minus two point something. That tells you a lot, right? So we need a reference. And people did that for all the major currencies, so the euro, the yen, the pound sterling, whatever. And they came up with roughly minus 0.4. So the Bitcoin currency, so to speak, is currently much more elastic than other currencies among each other, meaning that it is rather substitutable, that is an economic term. So you can easily substitute Bitcoin for something else. It doesn't tell you what, but it tells you in the market there is something going on that is a replacement of Bitcoin. Uh, might be another currency, might be gold, I don't know. Uh, while it's not that easy to replace, say, the euro uh, in comparison to the US dollar or you know, the yen, whatever. Uh, that is a histogram you know, of all the elasticities in small uh, portions, so in weeks, um, and you see it's really always negative and it's going down to minus 15, so it's really substitutable. Um, and, and then there's another funny thing. It changes the sign. So the, that was the average. If you do this now per month, over the time here, uh, and then the red dots are the situations where the elasticity is negative and the black ones are the one where it's positive, um, then you see that it's, well, a rather mixture. It's, it's a logarithmic scale, so it's really going up, down, up, down, up, down all the time and changing signs. And that is funny because a positive elasticity, if you go back to the de uh, defining equation, when this is positive, that means then the supply, or, well, no, the demand, sorry, the demand changes or goes up when the price goes up. So if gas becomes more expensive, you don't visit the gas station more frequently, do you? So in the end, that tells you that Bitcoin, at least at the black spots, is something like a luxury good, uh, good like diamonds or you know, gold or whatever. So people buy it, or there's a bubble, right? People buy it just for the sake, because it's going up, so it's more value, so I need it, right? It's like, like more psychological effect. Um, and then there is another economic argument. Um, the design of Bitcoin was meant to basically implement a deflation or at least a state, uh, static picture, the static availability of Bitcoins. So that in the end, uh, we cannot be taxed because inflation is a tax on the middle class, right? Because you lose your money when there is inflation, while big guys who own a company don't lose the money. So to get rid of the inflation, uh, they designed the protocol that over time, and uh, Stefan mentioned that there is this creation of new Bitcoins, um, that this goes up and saturates at some level, which is 21 million Bitcoins in the end, over time. But that is a rather naive picture. Um, probably you have as bad luck as I have. I had several hard disk crashes uh, in my lifetime. And what happens if your wallet, where your Bitcoins are stored, and your private key, vanishes? then your bitcoins are probably still in the system, so to speak, so they are somewhat, you know, identifiable in all the transactions. 
but they are not accessible, so they are of no economic value anymore. You cannot ex exchange them because you cannot access them. Or think more in the future, right? Someone dies, but his family doesn't know the password. No economic value in those bitcoins anymore. They cannot be used for any exchange anymore. And that happens, or that is the amount of bitcoins when just a fraction per year vanishes for different fractions, right? So the blue one curve is if 5% of all the bitcoins per year vanish, or, you know, by whatever means, right? There could be other uh, mechanisms, but if 5%, then it's basically down 2030. If it's 5%, well, that's not that bad, but uh, well, and green, green is 1%, uh, no, 0.1%, 0.1%, um, then, then, then that would be probably good. So, what is really this Q, right? The probability that you lose a fraction of the bitcoins available. And I tried to get that from the data. Um, so, this is the probability on the left scale when, or what was the delta time, so the last time, it's reference to today, when a bitcoin was used or transferred to some other entity. And, well, this is accumulated. Um, what it tells you, basically, is that if you s set an arbitrary threshold of, say, roughly two years, and if you say every Bitcoin that was not transferred to some other entity within two years, you regard as lost because nobody is really doing anything with it. I mean, there might be a guy saving it, but that is now the approximation we are doing here. If you have set that roughly to two years, then you end up with a fraction of 1% of lost bitcoins per year. So a relative measure, right? 1% of the bitcoins existing at that particular time or a year are basically lost or not accessible. Uh, and that means, this is the red curve again, right? This is Q1%, that bitcoin ultimately will vanish. There is no way, right? It, you can argue about the probabilities. You could argue that it is 10 to the minus 10 or whatever, but conceptually, Bitcoin will vanish one day. Um, so this Q actually was the best case scenario, as we learned in the financial crisis, because this probability was obtained under the assumption that one Bitcoin is not correlated to any other Bitcoin in the network, but that is not true. Think about a big guy with a lot of money then that one Bitcoin of him and this one is lost the same time, right? And there are, you know, correlations and the assumption of uncorrelated uh, events or dynamics is not true as we learned in the financial crisis uh, on the default risk. And then there is another huge correlation risk, right? A systematic risk, which would it be called? So think about the crypto wars. If you get them again under the pretext of terrorism or whatever, right? Then, well, probably a whole country cannot use Bitcoin anymore, at least legally. That means that at least a fraction of people, and even if it's one guy right, there and one guy in that country, that is correlated risk. So the queue will actually increase even more than my ballpark figure here. And then there might be some reform, whatever, political idea um, that correlates all the events. So in the end, that means when it vanishes, somehow the protocol must be improved to detect lost Bitcoins, right? and then doing something about it. But doing something about it means increasing the supply of Bitcoins, and that is inflation, which you want to uh, in, uh, avoid, right? And then at the same time, you need central information, centralized information, because you need this, this estimate, how much is vanished. But that is a central issue somehow, right? And then, well, you could say, okay, everything that wasn't used for 50 years, that is now invalid. By whatever technical means you do that. But then this is a democratic consensus of the participants, but that means basically a collectivism you know, on, on the property of individuals. Hmm, not good. Okay, that was the econo economic side. But does the protocol itself really you know, con conform to the concept that were proposed? So there is the implemented a self-adjustment that the whole network creates 2016 bitcoins per week and it's assumed that this process follows a Poisson distribution which means uncorrelated events so the probability to get one bitcoin today right is the same as yesterday and it doesn't really you know correlate like in the lottery actually um, and there is a self-adjustment implemented in the code um, well and at the same time 
your PC is probably not good enough anymore, so um, people joining into <laughs> pools. And this mining pools actually correlate now the, the production, basically, of Bitcoins, right? And if you look how many Bitcoins per week are created, then, well, this is rather arbitrary here, but I would like to distinguish an early phase where there are just a few participants and a later phase where well, the number of Bitcoins on the y-axis over time is rather, well, more or less the same, right? Okay, does this really follow a Poisson distribution as was claimed by the people implementing the protocol? And this is now the graph for the early and for the late phase, and this is the, the time between blocks appearing. Right? And that must follow, if it's Poisson process, this Poisson distribution, uh, which is basically an exponential, um, but forget the details here. So it's not really a difference between the black and the, the red curve. So the, the mean is more or less the same, right? It's the same shape. Well, anyhow. Now, is it a Poisson process? Uh, hardly, hardly, hardly. Because there is, um, well, a theorem, or nah, it's probably too much, but you know, some result that tells you that the expectation value, the mean, is the best estimator on the Poisson distribution. And that tells me, if I just take the data, it's 528 compared to 600, what it should be according to the protocol. So somehow this whole process creates more Bitcoins than the 600, uh, because the, the time in between is smaller in the average, right, than the 600 which was proposed. If you do a different fit, so you fit now to this data, a Poisson distribution, and then you get uh, an estimate of what really the parameter is, which in the end is, again, the mean here. Um, you even get a, a different, an even worse result. It's 200 seconds. So, meaning the best estimator doesn't agree with um, the parameter of the distribution, and that is a contradiction. And that is only, only really uh, solvable, that problem, by you know, saying, okay, that is not a Poisson distribution. Whatever happens here, it's not a Poisson distribution, and you see it. This is time, and this is the difference between what you see versus what you expect. And, well, here is a structure. There were only a few people. Forget that. That's a relaxation phenomena. But here, in the end, in the last year, there's structure in it. And the structure in this plot means that there is correlation. And that is probably because of the mining pools. The self-adjustment just doesn't work that way people assumed it. Right. These huge mining pools go into a kind of a resonance phenomena, I don't know, but this provides for correlation and therefore for resonance and therefore for the structure. Okay, and this was a global picture on the dynamics, now we get a detailed picture on the network of the transactions. Okay, let's go to the next uh, part. So what we're also trying to do is uh, to analyze the network of Bitcoins. So network analysis is a very hot topic in in various fields of, uh, of science, so it's, it's, it's a topic in physics, it's also a topic in computer science. What people actually look at is how do people interact? Right? <coughs> so there are lots of, of papers on how, the, for example, on how the telephone network is structured, so how many participants are there, how they are connected. There's um, studies on like uh, Facebook relations, how, how does this graph look like? There's a study on co-authorship networks, all kind of different things. And the nice thing about Bitcoin is that well, you actually see all the transactions, right? And you can do all the, redo all the stuff that, that, that we've invented or that one has invented in this field of, of network analysis and to apply it to Bitcoin and see whether we get some interesting results there. Um, so from now on, I would like to see Bitcoin as a network. Yeah? So um, I hope that everyone is familiar with what a graph is. So a graph is something like this here, right? It has nodes and it has, it has edges. And the nodes essentially correspond to all the addresses. Uh, so each node is essentially a public key that some party has generated, and there is some kind of connection between those, between those two, uh, yeah, between two nodes where there was any transaction uh, in the past. We don't care about how much money, how much Bitcoin there was uh, transferred, it's just there's an edge if there was any relationship between those two addresses. Yeah? So what a transaction actually is, when you authorize a transaction, you can take a couple of addresses yeah, where you take money from and you um, take a couple of addresses where you supply money, money to. Yeah? And you can essentially specify how much money you take from address 1, how much money from address 2, how much money from address n, and how much you, you give to this green address 1, etc. Et so if you look, look at this as a graph, 
it looks like this, right? I mean, essentially every address would be, every red address on the left side would be connected with, ev with every green address on the right side. And now you think of the whole thing, like we take all the hundreds of thousand Bitcoin transactions that we have, make this huge graph out of it. Right? You can't really look at this graph anymore, but you can do some kind of statistics on it. Um, actually, you can see this graph, or you can see the raw data. Right? If you go to a website that's called blockexplorer.com, you can actually see all the transactions that have been authorized at some point in time in the Bitcoin network. Yeah? So uh, if you go to the, to the main site, you can see all the blocks. So one block is essentially a list of transactions that has been uh, uh, authorized. And you can see there is, uh, each block has a number, uh, it is a timestamp, it uh, lists the number of transactions that it actually contained, and it lists the total amount of, uh, amount of Bitcoins that uh, were spent or transferred. And if you click on this, uh, on this link in the, first, in the first column, then you can see much, much more data. I guess you can't see it in the back. But uh, what you get here is, for example, you get the table of all the transactions. Uh, you have uh, in each um, uh, row, you have like, uh, listed the Bitcoin addresses where money was transferred from and the amount, and you have the addresses where money was transferred to. And if you look very closely here at the beginning, there's this hash value of the whole, of the whole block, and you can nicely see uh, it really starts with a few zeros, as I promised before. Yeah, so all the data is out there. What we, what we did, actually what a bachelor student of, our, uh, of, of ours did, he went through, this, uh, went through this site, grabbed all the data, and constructed this uh, huge network. So the first thing that we could, can look at is how connected is this graph? Yeah? And therefore we can plot the following histogram. So we take all the nodes yeah, that, that they are in the graph. They're huge. Yeah, this graph is huge. There are lots and lots of nodes. And for each node, we just count the number of edges, incoming or outgoing edges. And this is the parameter k for one node. And then we can plot the histogram. Like we can, we can count yeah, how many nodes have degree one. So how many nodes have only one single edge incoming or outgoing? How many nodes have two? incoming and outgoing edges, and so on, and so on. So we can, you can actually just count, right? And we did this for different points in time of Bitcoin. And what we did is we just plotted this data on a double logarithmic scale. Yeah? So the x-axis is this k parameter, yeah? and the y-axis tells you how many nodes in that graph there were that had this specific uh, degree k. Yeah? Um, and you can see lots of lines in this, in this plot, so the, so the, so the uh, uh, brighter lines, they, they correspond to the early days of Bitcoin, and the more darker lines correspond to the later days of Bitcoin. So what you can see is, uh, in the early days, this plot was a bit strange, right? There's lots of fluctuations, but um, as time goes by, we get some kind of nicely, uh, a nice curve, which is actually a slope. Yeah? So the whole thing somehow converges to a very nice graph, which is actually a slope. Uh, so, so, so a line that has a certain slope. Yeah? So this tells us, so this tells network people, that actually the distribution follows this nice mathematical formula. So the probability um, at a node, th that there is a node with, k, uh, with degree k, follows this law k to, the, k to the power of minus alpha. At least for, well, modern times of Bitcoin. And then what we try to, to, to see is whether this parameter changed over time. Yeah? So what you see here is now uh, on the, on the y-axis, this parameter alpha, so the slope of that line, depending on, well, the time, right? So we started in 2009 and we ended essentially this year. Uh, this year. And what you can see is actually, so disregard the, the beginning, the, the, there's probably not enough data there, but, but what you can see is that um, this parameter actually increases. And an increasing alpha means that the slope gets steeper, yeah? which means that uh, there are less and less nodes that have many incoming and outgoing edges, which in turn means that addresses are less and less frequently used. That means, again, Bitcoin users increasingly start to generate new public keys and private keys, new pseudonyms. Yeah, so the pseudonyms are used less frequently. 
Now, which is a good thing for anonymity, of course, because that tells us, or we can at least hope that it's much harder to, to identify people uh, if they use lots and lots of, of different pseudonyms for different transactions. The same result you can get if you do another analysis. So what we try to do here is to compute the diameter of the graph. So the diameter, I know this is now some kind of math lecture here. So the diameter of a graph you can compute by taking all the pairs of, of nodes of the graph. Yeah? So you take, take a pair and then you compute the minimal distance between those pairs, or between the pair in the graph. So the number of transactions that link or that, that ha um, needed to be performed to transform or one certain number of bitcoins from one address to another one. Yeah? And then you do this for all the, all the possible pairs of, uh, of nodes. Yeah? You compute the smallest distance between them and then you take the maximum of the whole thing. And this is the diameter. Yeah? So this is somehow the, the maximum minimal distance between two nodes in the graph. Uh, which shows you somehow whether the network is very much connected yeah? or whether, whether they are nodes that are some, somewhere far out and somewhere not, not connected with the rest. And it's surprising to see that this diameter increases. So there were two um, outliers. So uh, this is again a logarithmic scale. Yeah? So, so those outliers are actually huge. Yeah? So we have no idea why they are there. Uh, but even if you disregard those outliers, you can see that this, uh, the data um, um, nicely fits. And because this is a logarithmic scale, uh, like a, a line in a logarithmic scale is, act is actually an exponential increase. Yeah? So the diameter increases exponentially. Again, this tells us that the network gets loosely and loosely connected yeah, somehow. So again, this tells us that there is increasing anonymity present. Yeah? Good, this was the structure of the network. And we also looked a little bit about on the, on the, on the, on the transactions themselves. So the first thing that, that, that we looked at is how was the transaction volume that people uh, actually, uh, well, did at, uh, at Bitcoin. And if you plot the histogram of all the transactions, yeah, so again, you, uh, you say how many times was it, so this is again the rhythmic, so how, how many times were 100 Bitcoins transferred? Okay, it's like, uh, zero dot whatever eight so it's it's normal as frequency so you s you see that most of the transactions are between 100 bitcoins and between 0 0.01 bitcoins yeah but there is this strange little outlier on the far left so which actually tells us there were many transactions with with very very little bitcoin value in that network uh, in fact, those, those um, amount to 2.5% of all the transactions that occurred in Bitcoin. Yeah? They were transactions that transferred the least possible Bitcoin amount, which is 10 to the minus 8 Bitcoins. Yeah? And of course, we asked ourselves the question, I mean, was this an accident? Was this an attack? Or what was that? And it was somehow strange because this was always from one specific Bitcoin address. So we tried to see whether we can actually do something there or, or, or see what's the reason behind that. And to answer this question, we tried to do another analysis. Namely, we looked at how anonymous is Bitcoin as such. Right? So we talked lots, lots about users of pseudonyms and they can transfer money using different pseudonyms and when they change pseudonyms frequently, then it's probably hard to link the, the, the transactions. But there is one big problem within, within Bitcoin, namely, if uh, you have a transaction right, uh, that takes bitcoins from multiple addresses yeah, and transfers them to one or more bitcoin addresses, then you actually know um, all those transactions must, or all those amounts were authorized by the same person, which means that those addresses, I'm sure, belong to the same person or at least to the same entity, whatever this, whatever this means. Yeah? And you can actually see this again in the Block Explorer. There are transactions like this one where you have lots and lots of uh, different sender, sender uh, addresses and only uh, a few recipient addresses. Yeah? And what you can immediately learn from this is that those addresses here belong to the same entity. Yeah? 
so are somewhat connected. And in our graph, this means that all the nodes that correspond to those individual addresses are actually not different nodes, but they can, can be contracted into one single node, yeah? because this is one person, one entity controlling something behind that. Yeah? So there's one person who has this big pot of money that was just distributed over, over different, of, uh, different pseudonyms, yeah? but he needs to pool them to pay, to pay something out of it. Um, and we, then we tried to look at, at those uh, strange uh, transactions that had a very, very small amount. Yeah? And what you can see here is a histogram of all those transactions. So how many transactions uh, below 10 to the minus 6 uh, bitcoins were transferred over, over, this, over this period of time. And if you do this contraction idea, so if you collapse all the, all the addresses, yeah, that we know belong to the same person because they were used in some transaction right, together, then you end up with, a, with, a, with this plot on the right. So the red curve now shows the same thing, but not the number of addresses involved, but the number of, trans, uh, but the number of entities involved in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in those small transactions. And you can see the spike is suddenly gone. Right? This essentially tells us that this, this, this huge spike here yeah? Even though they, they use different addresses to, to, do this, to do this thing, we're actually controlled by one single, by one single guy. So this uh, somewhat confirms the hypothesis that's also been mentioned in, the, in, in one of the Bitcoin forums that this was a potential DOS attack on the system. Right? So someone just tried to authorize lots and lots of different transactions with very, very small volumes. Um, because you have to keep in mind that all the transactions are stored, right? And every, each and every bit client needs to, needs to store all the transactions that he's act actually able to verify new transactions, right? So along with, with, this, with, this, with this flood of, of, uh, of new transactions, of useless transactions, this guy uh, increased this, this, this data pool of, of transactions that every user needs to store by a tremendous amount. Good, just the last five minutes that I still have. Uh, let me uh, strive a little bit on the topic of anonymity. So what we've already seen is that, well, many people believe Bitcoin is anonymous, right? If you again go to Wikipedia, the ultimate source of knowledge, right? Um, uh, people say, well, unlike regular banking, which preserves customer privacy by keeping transaction records private, trans transaction anonymity is accomplished by Bitcoin in keeping the ownership of addresses private while at the same time publishing all transactions. So this is the big myth that's out there about Bitcoin. I mean, I'm, I'm actually private when I do this. And unfortunately, this is not really true. Um, so the following slides that I'm going to present uh, uh, is uh, taken from research work of uh, Reed and Harrigan that did an, an analysis of the anonymity of the Bitcoin system. So their paper is at this archive repository. I can really recommend you this paper. So what they did is they looked at, again, at this, uh, at this Bitcoin network and all these addresses, and they tried to identify or re-identify addresses. This seems to be tough at the first, the first glance because every user just generates public, public keys, and those public keys don't have a structure, right? This is just random numbers, essentially. But still, there are <coughs> a number of sources on the internet where can try to link addresses to some kind of personally identifiable information. And one of, this, uh, one of this source are Bitcoin faucets where you can redistribute Bitcoins in small amounts. And to prevent fraud, they somehow record who actually transferred or which address actually transferred money. And they also record the IP address where the, where the connection came from. So if you can mine this thing, so if you can download all the data, you can immediately um, link all those addresses, Bitcoin addresses, with IP addresses. Yeah? So you're not anonymous anymore. And what you can also do is you can you could look at forums, blogs, tweets. People frequently just announce, well, hey, here's my Bitcoin address. Just give me money. I'm doing this cool stuff. And if you can link somehow this address with, um, well, with some kind of personal identifiable information, such as an IP address, you, you are again linkable. Yeah. And if you look into this paper, what they try to do is they try to analyze the WikiLeaks uh, transactions. So WikiLeaks accepts Bitcoins as well. And they again claim, of course, perfectly secure, perfectly private. No one knows who you are. Um, and you can actually visualize which addresses actually transferred money to Bitcoin. 
Um, I'm not sure now whether this is the addresses or whether this is the entities, but it doesn't really matter. So Bitcoin is this, um, is this bubble in the middle, this green bubble there. And uh, the bigger the bubble, the more Bitcoins were transferred, right? And you can immediately visualize, um, well, all the entities that, that, that transferred money. And if you read that paper, they also actually claim that they could identify by this simple trick of uh, going through forums, going to, through, through Bitcoin faucets, they were able to identify a number of those points. So they were able to identify a few people who actually donated money to, to WikiLeaks, even though they claim it's actually, it's actually anonymous. Okay, we also looked at uh, some other anonymity stuff. So we asked ourselves the question, I mean, do Bitcoin users actually are they aware of the anonymity problems? Yeah? Do they use addresses, multiple addresses for different transactions? Yeah? So if you only generate one Bitcoin address or a couple of them and you always use them in your transactions, then this is a bad thing, right? Because all, the, all those transactions are eventually linkable. So we asked ourselves the question, how many addresses are used by one entity? Yeah? And again, we looked at all the graph that we had and we just counted the number of addresses that are used by each entity. And again, you can compute a histogram. So uh, the x-axis is the number of entities or the number of addresses one entity has, and the y-axis is the number of such entities. Right? So again, a histogram, again, in a, in, a, in, a, in a logarithmic scale. And what you can see is that we have this nice uh, formula again. So this is again a power law. Yeah, which means that there are a number of people who are actually very privacy sensitive, so they have an, many, many addresses, but most of the Bitcoin users lie somewhere here, which means that they use only a few Bitcoin addresses. So most Bitcoin users are actually not really privacy or an, an, an anonymous conscious, only a few of them are, because they use a lot of, lot of Bitcoin addresses. Um, by doing this trick of actually collapsing all the, all the uh, addresses that belong to the same entity, uh, we were able to reduce, so, uh, so if you look at the raw data of Bitcoin, of Block Explorer, then at, at, the, at the time where we looked at this, um, it had 882,500 uh, addresses in the blockchain, and if you just did the simple trick by contracting the addresses that occurred in the, in, in the same transaction as a sender, you ended up with 162,000 uh, uh, um, entities. Yeah? So there's a drastic reduction of anonymity just by this sim simple linking trick that anyone can do. So there's the last plot, promise. Um, this shows actually the scaling parameter. So let me go back. So we again saw that, that uh, this P of S has this power law. Again, there is this uh, scaling parameter over there, which is the slope of this, of this fitted line, of this red fitted line there. And we again looked at the question, how does this scaling behavior change over time? Yeah? And this plot shows you how this parameter changes. So the y-axis is this uh, slope, and the x-axis are the different time intervals that we, that we looked at. And what you can actually see is that um, uh, this parameter, well, decreases, but it's below zero, so the absolute value actually increases, which means that the slope gets much and much narrower, yeah? which again means that entities command over less addresses. So people are actually privacy conscious there. Yeah. So then, and fi final words. This brings us just to illustrate <coughs> really the problem to make you aware of, well, <coughs> referring to that WikiLeaks stuff, um, that this is not anonymous. And that this is, from an economical point of view, a really huge problem. Um, we show some data, which is publicly available, uh, of a well-known block. Uh, probably a few of you have uh, looked uh, onto it, at least over the last week. And that block is asking for Bitcoins. And, well, it doesn't really pay uh, to be a blogger um, that guy has made, at least from Bitcoin, $16 uh, exchange rate from November 29th. Um, so you could really see that, you know, what happened on different days, even up to the second, how many Bitcoins were going in and out of that address, what was <clears throat> the US dollar flow taking the Mount Cox exchange rate, and, well, accumulate that. And you can even learn something about that, and that makes even the anonymity uh, 
much more problematic. Look at the first transactions. They were rather funny, right? They were the same amount, then more or less the same amount went out. And it was a strange times, right? It was within 30 seconds, there was something going in. And then in the middle of the night, typical hacker uh, time, right? Uh, the stuff went out. And I'm pretty sure that this guy, probably is in the audience, um, tested his address, right? By sending something into that address and then pulling it out afterwards, after he confirmed, see, it's, it's roughly, what? 11 hours later. So 11 hours later, it confirmed, oh, I really received that stuff, it's working, so I can now put it on my block, right? Um, and that means, you know, um, th th this money ha had to come from someone. And this pattern here is so suspicious. I mean, it's not proof, right? It's not, in a, in a, well, in a real court, you probably wouldn't g provide that as evidence, but it's a hint, right? And somehow that money has, you know, been transferred from some other address. So I know this guy here, right? I know his block. I know that most likely he tested his Bitcoin address that he published on the block. And I could now go into the transaction history and find out from what addresses this test was started, right? So I knew the additional um, addresses that this person might use, or at least some of his acquaintances and friends, right? So I get really to dig into that. If I can assign one address, oh, a lot of people are now taking pictures because there seems there's the address. Okay. Um, okay, anyway, um, it's public knowledge. Um, so I could now assign, when I have one data point, right? I can assign one address of Bitcoin to one person, then I can work all the way through the chain, learn a lot, and if you were against the data retention, telecommunications data retention, you should be really aware of what you're doing in Bitcoin. And most likely, a lot of you guys probably are pissed off by the SWIFT scandal, uh, where all the transaction data <coughs> from banks are transferred to some other country. Um, well, um, it's not even necessary to convince some politician to do that. Um, it's available, right? And this is basically, I think, one of the biggest problems why Bitcoin would not be really something for companies, you know, because this is basically full disclosure of the financial state or status of a company, right? You can learn how, what is the amount, what is, how high is, high is the price for some service, for some good? What, what is actually the rebate that some company pro gives to another company? You can learn that all, and you can actually get also from the patterns a lot of information on the behavior of a person, right? Um, think about that. That person was most likely, if it was a test, which I'm pretty sure it was, uh, was uh, awake at 5 p.m. and it was awake at the next day at 4 p.m. 11 hours, probably didn't even get sleep in between. Um, well, kind of funny. Um, there are a lot of transactions which was tend to the something, then this is this funny transaction here, which is basically probably something I would like to get rid of all my Bitcoins or something. So you can really learn a lot about the behavior, as we already showed last year about the telecommunications data retention network. Um, you can now learn that even more publicly, so to speak, from Bitcoin network. Okay, to sum things up, and as a take home message, so the protocols somehow need to be improved, right? There is this vanishing problem. There is, if you want, if you follow a political agenda with your Tobin tax or whatever, um, then you need to change the protocol. Um, Bitcoin is not anonymous, and therefore it's probably not the stuff that larger companies would like to use. In particular, the financial industry will never ever use that for that reason. Um, there is probably an application, but you have to be really sure that the deflation thing is not really, well, it's really deflation because you lose Bitcoin. So in the end, when you change the protocol, you might have inflation. Um, and with this full disclosure of financial data, you open the doors for industrial espionage, right? Um, there's interesting network dynamics, all the funny histograms we have shown, right? This is really an interesting network, probably more or less unique. We have all the data, we have 
all the stuff. In other areas, we don't have that. Right? But here we can really look into that, so as a basic research thing, that's very interesting. And therefore, it's a really an ideal de test bed. You can learn a lot about the physics of complex systems here. You can learn a lot about adaptability and evolvability of you know, social entities and how that complex dynamics arises. And as a final application note, um, what we are thinking about is, so wh why did we present that and did all this analysis? Think about that if you would like to provide a laundry service. So there are some available. You, they claim that you can put in some you know, bitcoins and they somehow you know, mix them up and you know, give them then to the final address. First of all, you trust an anonymous person here, right? Well, more or less anonymous person that he actually transfers your Bitcoin afterwards to some other entity. Uh, so you don't trust banks where you can at least see a person, where you know where the office is, but you trust some money laundering guy on the internet? Funny. Um, and at the same time, whenever this person or the, his service or her service is deviating from all the statistics we have shown, I can identify that. Right? So you have to fulfill at least all these statistical things to really design an effective and ideal uh, Bitcoin laundry. If you, in one of those aspects, deviate from that, that is a signal to be detected and you know, to attack that laundry service, and that is, well, project upcoming paper, um, how probably to avoid that and deal with all that stuff. And that is really the last, you know, more or less the outlook of our up to now research. And with the final words, I would like uh, to wish you a Merry Crisis and a Happy New Fear. Okay, we have now very short time for a few questions. So please line up at the microphones in the two alleys and ask your question. Go ahead. So my question is about um, the idea that transactional anonymity, or rather like the privacy of your transactions is actually important. The, um, you said it's a big problem, but the, one of the charts that you had seemed to show that as Bit, the Bitcoin network grows, more and more entities in the network are having fewer and fewer addresses. And that seem, at least it seems to me that that represents that newbies, people using Bitcoin for the first time because there's, the network has been growing a lot, really don't give a shit about if everyone can see their transactions because they're using a very small number of keys anyway. And, and it seems to me that like services like PayPal kind of bear that out. Like that's what everyone that does digital payments is using now. And that's, you know, that's that it, it's out there, it's out there for the government to mine and download. So what, how do you reconcile the fact that the, the, the permanent record of everyone's transactions is a big problem, but all the new users don't mm -hmm. like, seem to be using small number of addresses anyway? So um, to, to answer that in two parts. Um, so the first thing is, uh, while obviously there are a lot of problems, I'm not claiming, or we are not claiming, that any other services of some established company the one you mentioned with the P at, at the beginning is better, right? So this might be better than what is available. Okay, first thing. Second thing, um, you, you can slightly address this concern that, that, that you mentioned, or that, that is the core of your question, by normalizing to the numbers of users or to an estimate of the number of users. And so you basically divide the average. There are some statistical problems here, but anyway, we didn't show that slide. We have so many of these plots, right? And it seems that the effect of the growing number of users is not completely an explanation. So it doesn't really compensate the the exp it cannot it can basically not uh, compensate the exponential increase in the diameter alone, plus the scaling stuff that we have shown afterwards. Okay. So it's, prob it's probably a combination of both, right? M many newbies yeah, who definitely. only actually have a few addresses and people that become more, more privacy con uh, conscious. I mean, definitely they are newbies, definitely, and even more, sure. But even if you try to calculate them out or compensate for them, um, there, there is a signature. Okay, time is running out. We can only take one more question from over there. And may I remind you to please be seated until the question and answer session is over. 
because it's very impolite if you just go up and leave. People want to listen what, uh, to the questions. Go ahead. So uh, regarding the uh, deflation of the currency, uh, you basically mentioned that uh, at, if at a later point the protocol is changed so that more Bitcoin is added to the pool, that would make it uh, an inflationary currency. Can you explain why that is exactly um, that is basically the issue? Uh, why why it would not be possible to add bitcoins and still keeping the currency deflation? Well, <laughs> so you you could just compensate. For, so if if there is loss of bitcoins, right, you could compensate for that definitely. But how much? That's the problem. That is a centralized information gathering, which by design is not included, and which is quite the opposite to what economy is, right? Economy is a decentralized effort to get into transactions. So you, in theory, you could do that and provide for still 21 million active whatever bitcoins. But for that, you need to change the protocol to that someone and who is aware of how many active or accessible bitcoins are there. And then someone has that is in the second step, someone has to do something about that. And, the, and whenever you have that central person, right, he might follow a different agenda. And so the ultimate th stuff would be if you, see down, if you see a slow down, people would typically react as the normal bankers do, right? Oh, oh my God, the economy. So in that part, people would say, oh my God, the Bitcoin economy. And then they would just start to print new, well, print not new, but allow new Bitcoins. So they will overshoot. There's, there must be the tendency to overshoot because if they don't do, people will leave Bitcoin because they cannot do any transactions anymore. So they, well, that is a prediction. Probably all the people in the Bitcoin network are more enlightened than the bankers, probably. But the overshooting stuff will, will lead to at least um, a temporary inflation and then the whole idea is basically broken, right? I mean, the appeal of that was that you don't have inflation. Okay, time's over. Um, I don't know, maybe you'll stick around and sure. answer some questions outside the door. Um, so please put your hands together and thank the two uh, for their thank talk. You.